Let's stand together and thank God. He forgave all of our sins away, washed all of our sins away. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. I'm thankful, Lord, that when the verdict was given for my soul, I was found not guilty, washed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. We're going to be turning in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians, but while you're grabbing your Bibles and, and uh, getting situated, why don't you be friendly with someone and shake their hand, step out across the aisle and hug their neck and express your appreciation for them on this Sunday morning. Thank God for our church family. Amen. Praise God. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 18. We're glad to see all of you in the house of the Lord. It's good to be in God's house around God's people. Amen. Paul writing to the church in Corinth. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let me read that first part again. But we all, with open face, everybody say open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. Now, this morning, you'll understand my title a little bit as we get into my message, and it won't be a long message at all, but I, I want to bring several things out, and I think it will make sense as we get into it. I want to talk to you about four things this morning. My subject is this, healing, freedom, obedience, and service. Healing leads to freedom. Freedom, of course, means you obey the Lord, and that will lead you into service of the Lord. Let's pray before we're seated. Father, we thank you for your word on this Sunday morning. Thank you for allowing us to have a great Sunday school class this morning, adult class, teen class, the smaller children. Thank you for meeting with us in our hour of Sunday school. Thank you for meeting with us in our worship service. God, I believe you've already touched people. I believe you've already healed people. I believe you've already strengthened people. I believe you've already met needs. Lord, as we come to the preaching of the word, I pray that you'd prepare our hearts to receive the word of God. Open our hearts to receive the word of God. Let us leave this place better than the way that we came. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. When we talk about wounding and healing we look at God's purpose behind healing us and behind restoring us and I believe everyone would agree with me when I say that everything God does and everything that God allows has a positive intent and a positive objective God never allows something to happen to us with a negative intent or a negative objective now what might happen to you you might think is negative but God allows it to happen with a positive intent or a positive objective he uses pleasant things he uses painful things in our lives as tools and instruments to accomplish his divine purpose a week and a half ago I was wrapping up this message for today and I had to go to the dentist and I've uh, been having a lot of dental work this year trying to get things taken care of. I guess as I'm getting older, my teeth are just needing a little more TLC. And uh, if you've got dental insurance, you ought to thank God for that. And you ought to use it. I, don't, I can't understand people that have dental insurance and don't use it because I've never had dental insurance. I've always had to pay out of pocket. And so I'm at Dr. Amy Temple's office. She's been my dentist for a long time and very sweet uh, Christian woman. And I uh, was laid back there and 
She numbed the right side of my mouth, and I don't like needles. I especially don't like needles going into my mouth, especially when you can see them going in your mouth. Amen. And uh, these needles they put in your mouth, you know, they're like that long. At least they feel like it. And she says, now you know the drill, Reverend Engel. Just it's going to hurt. I said, yeah. I, you know, first of all, don't ask me to carry on conversation with you when my mouth's open. You know, ask me all these questions. I can't answer you. But she sticks that needle in, and, of course, I grimace. And then she, she says, now this is going to be the worst part. She pushes that stuff down in my gum. and Oh, man, it's like pushing peanut butter in there. Hurt like crazy. Then they walk off and say, well, take, we'll take a little while. We're going to do some things. And you're going to start feeling a little numbness from here over. Okay. Sooner or later, it's tingling, and I can't form words, and my lips flopping around. And, and uh, she comes in and says, everything pretty numb? I say, yes, ma'am. And uh, she tapping on that tooth. You feel that? I said, no, ma'am. So she gets the drill out. Well, she's drilling, and obviously that she hadn't put enough sedative in there, and she hit a nerve. Folks, you want to talk about talking in tongues in a dentist chair. That's never happened to me before. I almost came unglued. And it was it was unconscious. It was just a reflexive motion. Just, ah. And she said, I am so sorry. We must not have got enough. So out came the needle again. And uh, finally, they got it to where she could drill and, and I couldn't feel it. But, you know, when I, when I got in my car and I couldn't hardly talk from here over, couldn't slurp a straw, couldn't form a word, you know, couldn't whistle. Just basically went home and my puppy looked at me like, what in the wrong, what's wrong with you? You look like you had a stroke or something. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, but I began to think about that. The outcome was positive, but the tool that she had to use to get me to that point was painful. And the Lord uses painful experiences sometimes to get us to a positive outcome. And I'd rather go through a little bit of pain for a moment with a drill, trying to get some stuff out of there that shouldn't be there, than to ignore it and have an abscess later and die from poison in my bloodstream. And so the Lord uses painful experiences sometimes, tools, instruments to accomplish his divine purpose. But then you have to say, Pastor, what is God's purpose? What is the ultimate goal that he is endeavoring to fulfill in our lives? Well, first of all, before we can answer that, we need to talk about this. All of us are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, that means you. So in creation, God formed mankind in his own image. The word image refers to more than just a physical likeness. It refers to the nature and the character of God. Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. It's not what I'm preaching about this morning, but let me just stop and say, nowhere in the Bible do you find a homosexual alliance a precedent for that anywhere. It's very clear that even back in Genesis 127, in the early writings of the Pentateuch, God made a man and he made a woman. And he put the man and the woman together and physically their bodies fit together. And that's the precedent that God set. He did not make Adam and Steve. He made Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, that God image was ruined and marred. Man and woman still look the same on the outside, but the character and the nature of the inner man became warped and deformed. So God's personal goal for each of us children is to rebuild and renew that original image within us. And God is in the process of restoring what was lost. Some of you might have projects around your house that you're constantly doing. My grandfather had a little, uh, my mom's dad had a little place behind the house. He called it his man shed or his man cave. And it was constant projects that were like 
halfway done. And every year we'd go up every couple of years and, and that project would be a little bit further on, but he'd just get back there and tinker and have multiple projects. And some of you may have projects. Maybe you're redoing your cabinets. Maybe you're repainting a certain room and maybe you're redoing the floors one room at a time, or maybe you're building a, uh, uh, an, an art project and it's just kind of taking shape. Let me tell you, our God is working on us and we are his remodeling project. We are his remodeling project. He is renovating us. He is conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. Let's all say conform. Conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The word conformed, translated from the Greek, is sumorphous. And it means, and it has the word morph in it, M-O-R-P-H. It means to change or alter the image or the shape of something. And so God is conforming us. He's altering us. He is changing our shape. He is changing our image. I'm not talking necessarily the outside, amen. I'm talking about the inside. I'm talking about the character and the nature of a person, although we do believe in holiness on the outside. Amen. Praise God. God's ultimate purpose is to restore the image of his character within us. God wants to make mankind like it originally was, exactly like him. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, Paul said, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So the question that we need to ask ourselves today is, how close or how far am I from the image of Jesus Christ? How much conforming, how much sumorphous still needs to happen in me? Where am I in the paradigm? Where am I in the spectrum of conforming to Christ? Am I way over on this side and I've got a lot more conforming to do? Or am I kind of over near where God wants me to be? Where are we in the journey? And only you and the Lord know the answer to that question. The reality is, is that the image of God has been marred within us. We have all come into the kingdom of God battered and bruised and injured. Our wounds and scars have made us incapable of obeying God and living a righteous, holy life. Amen. If I pass the microphone around today, many of you would have testimonies that would be heart-wrenching of where God brought you from and how God changed you. Praise God. I don't care how long you've been in church this morning, friend. Let me just gently remind you and I that I needed a Savior. You needed a Savior. We were lost without God. Our lives were a shipwreck. We were on our way to hell. We didn't have our act together. We didn't know what we were doing. We weren't good enough. Amen. No matter how hard we tried, we got worse and worse and worse. Thank God for the blood of Calvary. I needed the blood of Calvary. I don't know about you, but I need it. I need it even more right now. Praise God. The pain that we suffered imprisoned us. The offenses, the grudges that we carried deep in our spirit held us hostage and prevented us from being completely obedient as children of God that we were called to be. Let me break it down. Our painful memories made us afraid of completely trusting anybody, even God. Our painful memories caused us to build walls of anger and bitterness and resentment, and this kept us from full communion with God. However, God's purpose was to turn all of that around. God's purpose was to use the injustices and the pain that we had suffered to turn us toward him and to morph us, as, as Paul said, to conform us, to morph us into the character, into the image of God. Colossians 3 and 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I said it Wednesday night. I'll say it again. He's still working on me. 
to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Say, Pastor, I'm not where I used to be. No, no, no. Thank God for that. But don't celebrate just yet because we're not where we need to be either. I'm thankful that I'm not what I used to be. I'm thankful that I don't hang with the people I used to hang with and live the life that I used to live and act the way that I used to act. But, folks, I'm on a journey. The train has not got to the station yet. I'm still on a journey. And one day when the trumpet of God sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise, then we will see the image that God has created in us. Somebody clap your hands and shout amen. Now that we have turned to him for salvation, God desires to go even further with us, to heal us, to make us whole, to restore us and reconstruct our character into what he originally intended to be. What I'm preaching about this morning is he wants to heal the pain. Pain and hurt can only be healed by making contact with the presence of God. Inner Healing comes only in God's presence. Search the New Testament out. Nobody was ever healed unless they made contact with Jesus or somebody on their behalf made contact with Jesus. None of the synoptic gospels ever record one miracle where someone just sat up in bed and said, I'm healed without Jesus Christ being somehow involved. They either got out of bed and went to Jesus or somebody picked up their bed and took them to Jesus or a parent said, stay here, I'm going to go to Jesus or Jesus came to them. You need something from God this morning, friend? You got to get desperate about it. You got to lift your voice up. You got to reach out to God. You can't just sit there like a bump on a dill pickle and expect a miracle from God. Great things happen in the presence of God. Inner healing comes only in God's presence. And I believe that some Christians are never healed and liberated from inner offenses because we will not unveil and expose those offenses in God's presence. We keep those things hidden and buried deep in our hearts. I've seen some Christians deny that we have any offenses or hidden grudges. We either pretend that they don't exist or we are honestly unaware that we have stuff buried deep inside of us. I've seen people actually defend and justify their offenses. And the attitude is, I've been offended, and I'm going to stay offended until somebody apologizes or fixes the situation. Well, in order for hidden offenses to be healed, you got to get them out and put them in the presence of God. You can't jealously guard your hidden offenses, zealously guard your hidden offenses, and expect God to heal them. You have to acknowledge there's a problem, pull it out, lay it on the altar, and say, God, I'm sick of dealing with this. I'm tired of dealing with this. I don't have to deal with this anymore. I need deliverance. We have to admit those offenses. We have to confess them. We have to repent of them and ask God to heal them and release us from their destructive power. Offenses. The Bible talks about offenses. Our grudges, our pain, our resentment, our anger. It's got to be laid before God. It's got to be touched by the presence of God. For only God's presence can heal us, restore us, and set us free. He wants to bring us healing and liberty. Everybody say healing and liberty. Say, so, Pastor, I'm not sick today. I don't need a healing. I'm not talking about necessarily physical sickness right now. Physical ailments. Maybe you've got pain in your body. We all know God can heal pain. Maybe you've got a sickness or a disease you're struggling with. We all know God can heal pain. 
and the beautiful quandary that a Christian finds themselves in, as Paul said, is whether I live or whether I die, I'm with Christ. I mentioned Sister Hal this morning. Sister Hal's not expected to live more than just a few days. She's lost her ability to swallow. And Lou Gehrig's disease is a terrible, terrible disease. Named after the famous baseball player, Lou Gehrig, back in the last century that uh, was very, very famous and died at a young age. And so Lou Gehrig's disease takes away your ability to function and control your own muscles and, and swallowing, for example. And it's devastating. But, you know, even if Sister Hal is not healed and she dies... The plight that a Christian finds themselves in, the wonderful plight, I might add, is we wake up on the other side with a glorified body. You can't lose with the stuff I use. Praise God. So when we say God can heal, we don't mean just a surface healing. We mean God can give the ultimate healing. But I'm not necessarily talking about physical healing today. I'm also talking about the bruising and the crushing of a spirit. God has a divine purpose in healing inner offenses. And that divine purpose is to, to give us liberty. Jesus Christ stated that one of his specific purposes in coming to this earth was to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4 and 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So, so many times we automatically think healing is physical healing. When Jesus spoke of healing, he intertwined it with physical and a mental, emotional healing. The very words of Jesus reveal that. The word translated here, bruised, Luke 4.18, means crushed. Crushed. God wants to heal us from the bruising and crushing that our spirit has suffered through the years. To set us free from the lingering pain and chronic bitterness that threatens to contaminate our entire being. When God heals us, he sets us free. Praise God. Hey Amen. I remember growing up in church with a hymnal on every pew. Every pew had a hymnal right there in the hymnal uh, 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 holder there before you. And a little stack of tithing envelopes and a pencil and a hymnal. Amen. And we'd fight to get to church first and see who could get the hymnal. Guard that hymnal, amen, because there was only about three of them on the whole pew until you memorized the words, and then you could tell who the newbie was because they didn't need the hymn. They needed the hymnal, and the old people didn't need the hymnal. Little Pentecostal mind games that we used to play, amen. But one of the songs was, Once like a bird in prison I dwell, No freedom from my sorrow I fell, But Jesus came and listened to me, Glory to God, he set me free. And then the song director would hold up his hand like this. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. Glory to God, he set me free. Hey, do we still believe that? Do we still believe that Jesus came by one day and reached down and picked us up out of the miry clay, set our feet on the solid rock, established our goings, gave us a purpose? Do we still believe that? Praise God. Amen. I love the old songs. I love the new songs too, but I love the old songs. I told Brother Marcus South Wednesday night, he pulled out one of those oldie goldies. Man, I'm going to tell you, that took me back to the day. Hey, man, I enjoyed that. Those old songs, I can belt it out. My daughter tells me sometimes, she says, Dad, I can tell when this old songs because you sing like you're at the opera. And I said, well, it's kind of hard to sing that when it's one of them Jesus is my boyfriend songs with a million words on the screen. You can't stop looking at the screen because you'll get lost. You know, what I'd really like to do is close my eyes and worship for a moment, but I'm too scared because I'm going to lose my place in the song. Somebody say amen. 
We're just having fun, aren't we? Thank God for the oldies. I like the new ones, but thank God for the oldies. Praise God. God does not give us liberty, however, so we can do like we want to do. Some of us, once Jesus Christ set us free from our inner offenses, we've used that freedom to do our own thing. Jesus Christ didn't set you free from sin so you could go do your own thing and become the servant of sin. He set you free from sin so that, irony of all ironies, you would be bound to him. You're going to be bound by somebody. By doing our own thing, that just brings a recurrence of the bitterness cycle. After we've done our own thing for a while, we find ourselves trapped in bitterness and offenses all over again. And that's why the Bible says that when a backslider walks away from God, the devil that was there goes and finds seven more. Enters into that person. Now, folks, I'm not trying to scare you. But going, walking away from God is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And the more you walk away from God and the more comfortable you get with doing that, the more bound you become and the harder it is for you to come back. You say, well, I thought God can do anything. God can do anything. But he puts the burden on you. And he warns you in the scripture. Now think about this. If I walk away from God, and the devil that was there goes and finds seven more, and he comes in, now there's eight, and I come back, and I pray back through, and God sets me free, and I live for God, and I backslide again, and those eight go out and find seven each. Come on, do the math with me. Now we got 56 devils. And I come back and I pray back through and the Lord sets me free and I backslide again. And those 56 go out and find seven devils. Now we got 392, I believe. Then those 392 come back and start to get a little crowded. And then God sets me free and I pray back through and I get to live for God and I backslide again. Now 392 go out and get seven. Now we're up to about 2,400. Folks, do the math. It don't take very long and you're in a bad spot. I don't think I need to remind you, it's July the 21st of 2019. All major prophecies have been fulfilled in the Bible. We're ready for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. One of the dumbest things you could do right now is to walk away from God. I'm not going anywhere, praise God. I'm staying around the cross. I'm sticking with Jesus. Somebody say amen. God does not heal, and I'm closing, our bitterness and offenses to make us feel better about ourselves. God heals us and sets us free from our offenses so we can serve him and obey him. When we use our freedom to obey God and serve him to the best of our ability, then you do feel a whole lot better about yourselves. Obeying God takes away the sense of self-condemnation and guilt that disobedience brings to our lives. Romans 8 and 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's why on New Year's Eve, watch night service, when we all come together and we have the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet, that's why it's always one of the best services all year, because we've just obeyed God. We've done something very sacred. We've obeyed a sacrament. And there's such a feeling of peace in the service because the, uh, all of us know, I've just obeyed the Lord. Self-condemnation is gone. Obedience brings peace. By walking in the spirit of obedience, we're free and liberated from self-condemnation. Our conscience is free from guilt and blame, and God heals our spirits to give us liberty, and obedience produces a better Self-image. So healing, freedom, obedience, service, it's all connected. God doesn't heal you for you to go back to your stuff. God doesn't heal you and set you free for you to go back to your, to your bondage. He heals you and sets you free so you'll obey him and serve him. And I close with 
what is the true nature of liberty? I mentioned something Wednesday night. We're in July right now. July, of course, is uh, summertime. Uh, July the 4th celebration we just went through. Thank God for the privilege to be an American. And I don't care what, what political leaning you have, whether you're independent, Democrat, Republican, or not registered at all. It doesn't really matter right now. What, what matters is that we're all American citizens, and we still have a freedom to worship in this country. We still have a freedom of religion in this country. We have a freedom to own our Bibles. We have a freedom to speak the name of Jesus. We have a freedom to come to church and associate with fellow believers. We have a freedom to vote. We have a freedom of speech, amen. You can stand out in the public square and hold a Bible in your hand and sing unto the Lord all day long and nobody can tell you you can't do it. Thank God for that. America's not perfect. America's got its faults, but I still believe it's the greatest nation on the planet. And as long as we keep in God we trust as our motto, God's going to continue to bless us. As long as we stay the friends and allies of the nation of Israel, God's going to continue to bless us. So when we talk about liberty, we're not necessarily talking about that form of liberty, although thank God for that. But it's important we understand the true nature of our God-given liberty. Brother Marcus, if you'll come to the piano, please. Kingsley said this, and I quote, see Kingsley, there are two freedoms. Everybody say two. The false freedom where one is free to do what he likes. Second freedom is the true freedom where one is free to do what he ought. J. Oder, O-E-R-T-E-R, giving him credit for this statement, he said, quote, personal liberty is the right to act without interference within the limits of the law. Personal liberty. Now, as much as I like to get in my car and push the gas pedal, my freedom to do that at 90 miles to 100 miles an hour could cause me to lose my freedom. I had a pastor one time that was a client of mine. <laughs> he brought a brand new Ford Mustang, GT, loaded. Got out on one of the highways here in North Carolina. And he said, man, you know, I'd just like to see what this thing will do. A long time since I had one of these, since he was a teenager. I'm talking to a guy in his middle ages. Long, flat stretch, looked around. 110 mile an hour. State trooper clocked him. State trooper pulled behind him. And as soon as he saw the blue lights, he slowed down and stopped. State trooper came and said, what in the world are you doing? 110 mile an hour. He said, officer, I promise. I just bought this car. I just want to see what it would do. And man, I've never been in a car like this. And he kind of talked. And the officer said, you know why? The only reason I'm not going to take you to prison, the only reason is because I just got that new cruiser. And if you hadn't have done what you did, I couldn't have seen what it could do. Right. So you say, well, I, I'm free to speed. Your freedom can get you in trouble. You have to operate your freedom within the confines, the parameters. Now, he didn't just let him go. The pastor had to pay a $1,000 fine on top of the cost of court, plus me. And I ain't cheap. Total thing cost him about $2,000. And, you know, I asked him, I said, was it worth it? I'm not going to tell you what he said. That's client confidentiality. But you know, your personal freedoms can get you in trouble. Well, I'm free. I'm free to do what I want. You better stay within the left side and the edge side. I'm free to go all on that road. But don't forget, there's a ledge over here and a ledge over here. There's a ditch on one side and a ditch on the other. You're free to be on the road, but you got to stay in the road. And the Lord gives us certain freedoms, doesn't he? 
The Lord gives us certain liberties, but we can't take advantage of those liberties and abuse those liberties. G. McDonald said, Freedom is not the liberty to do whatever one likes, but the power of doing whatever one sees ought to be done, even in the very face of otherwise overwhelming impulses. So the scripture teaches us clearly, and I'm closing, please stand with me. Teaches us clearly that our liberty in Christ is not for our benefit, but the benefit of other people. So, Pastor, what in the world do you mean? Well, let's go to Galatians 5.13. Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So the liberty that he gives you doesn't mean you have a license to go out and sin. You know, James Bond ostensibly had a license to kill. Makes you wonder if there aren't secret, covert, dark, underground type operations in our, within our military where people have a license to kill. And I'm not talking about overseas because that's enemy combatants. I'm talking about within the United States. I, don't go there. That's conspiracy. But, you know, James Bond has a license to kill. When you get the Holy Ghost, you don't get a license to sin. Okay? When you're cruising down the interstate of life and you're, you, you sin and Jesus pulls you over and you pull it out and say, well, I've got a license to sin. Remember, you gave your life for me on Calvary. That's not the way it works. You're going to get a ticket. Okay? You can't just sin when you want to sin. That's not what the Holy Ghost is about. That's not what the grace of God is there. The grace of God is there for if you accidentally sin, you have forgiveness. Satan desires to use our pain and suffering to destroy us. God desires to use it to draw us closer to himself and to remodel our character back to its original form, to mold us into his image. God wants to heal everybody here this morning, not just from your headache and your backache and diabetes and high blood pressure, whatever it might be, but he wants to heal you from inner pains, to heal you from grudges, bitterness, and anger that suffering has caused. And if we confess our inner offenses to him and repent of our attitudes, God will heal us, liberate us, and set us free. We had a guy that came to church in the old building back on Bodenhammer was a prince of a man. I mean, just a jewel of a man. Loved the church, loved me, loved my young little family. He was old enough to be my great-grandpa. But his wife would not come to church. And so I asked one time, I said, do you think if I went and talked to your wife it would help? He said, brother, you can try. I don't think it'll help, but you can try. So I went over there one night. We had dinner, and I just asked her. I said, sister, let me ask you a question. Why won't you come to church with your husband? She said, you want the truth? I said, yeah, well, yeah, I'd actually prefer you not lie to me about it. Well, you know, why won't you come to church? She said, well, I'll tell you why. Y'all are Pentecostal. And I said, and? She said, well, I went to a Pentecostal tent revival one time when I was a young lady. And I don't like crowds. I don't like to speak in front of crowds. And the preacher called me out of the crowd and handed me the microphone and told me, say something for the Lord. She said, and I felt like I could just crawl in a hole and disappear. It embarrassed me so bad. I said, so we're talking like 1970s? She said, yeah, 70, 72, 73. I said, you realize I was born in 1972? She said, yeah, okay. I said, so when I was a baby, this little thing happened to you. It was terrible for you. It, it really just mortified you. But that was like, you know, at that point, 25 years ago? She said, that's right. Okay. And... You won't come back to a Pentecostal church because you're scared a preacher's going to stick a mic in your face? So would it surprise you if I told you I've never stuck a mic in somebody's face? It's not going to happen. I mean, we're at Bodenhammer. There's 20 of us. You don't even need a mic. We just say, gather together, gather together. Yeah. Right? I said, it's not going to happen. I would never do that to you. We had a great dinner, great conversation. Bottom line is she paid her tithes to the church, would not darken the doors of the church because of that offense, because of that grudge. That's the kind of stuff I'm telling you. God wants to heal that. Don't hold on to something. For God's sake, that happened 
You know, when Noah got off the ark, when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth, and you're still holding on to that thing, let it go for crying out loud. Let it go. Don't allow the devil to hold you prisoner by that. Let God heal you of that. God gives us liberty not to use for our own purposes, but to fulfill his purpose, obeying him and serving one another. Thank God for healing, not just physical healing, but thank God for all other kind of healing. The Bible says with his stripes we are healed. That's just not physical healing. That's every kind of healing. Thank God that when he heals us, he frees us to serve him. Thank God when he frees us to serve him, we can obey him. Amen. And we can do his will. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord right now. Praise God. Come on, let's worship him. Lift your hands with me all over the house. Father, thank you for setting us free this morning. Thank you for healing our bodies. Thank you for healing our minds. Thank you for healing our spirits. Hallelujah. God, I'm not going to hold on to something that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and be bound by that. I'm not going to hold that grudge, God. I'm not going to hold that offense. I'm not going to allow the devil to trap me up. Some kind of garbage that I couldn't control anyways. Forgive me, Jesus. Heal me, Jesus. Set me free, Jesus. Loose me from that, God. So that I'm free to obey you. So that I'm free to serve you. So that I'm free to live for you. Oh, hallelujah. Your mercy is not a license to sin. Your grace is not a license to sin. But thank God if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. I feel his forgiveness in the house this morning. I feel his mercy in the house this morning. I feel his grace in the house this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. This altar is open if you'd like to come and pray this morning. Let's spend a few moments in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.